Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining my talk uh, today at the European Chapel. I am the co-founder and CTO of uh, Raza, and I'm going to be talking about um, uh, an approach and a philosophy to building conversational AI that we call conversation-driven development. Uh, okay. Um, firstly, you know, just a very, very quick one slide uh, introduction to Raza. Um, what we do is we build the standard infrastructure for conversational AI. Uh, so we build a very widely used open source library, uh, which is used across a whole bunch of different industries, you know, healthcare, insurance, banking, of course, uh, being big ones, but also retail, telecommunications and manufacturing and really used by the largest companies in the world across all of these different industries uh, to build mission critical conversational AI. Um, and we have sort of a, a very large developer community. Um, I mean, you've got a graph of the downloads on the right. Um, it just keeps growing faster every year. Um, and so we have a, a sort of a very wide user base of folks who are building conversational AI. We, you know, talk to them and learn from them uh, and try and share kind of the, the lessons that our community is learning. And so to give a bit of context uh, on why conversation driven development is important, I first want to talk about the five levels of conversational AI, uh, which is our maturity model describing, you know, um, how sophisticated AI assistants can get. Um, and there's an obvious analogy with uh, self-driving cars, right? That's obviously where we took the, the framing from. Um, and what I love about the, the, the way that the self-driving car people talk about it is it's very easy to remember what level five means, right? It's purely described from the end user experience. Level five autonomous driving means you can take a nap in the back of the car um, and arrive at your destination, right? Um, and so for conversational AI, actually, I think there are two different perspectives. One is the end user perspective, um, and the other is the, the developer perspective. Um, and so CDD is more on the developer perspective. But start with the end user side of things. Um, so we have these five different levels from, you know, command line apps all the way to very sophisticated assistants. And then on the developer side, we have um, the introduction of CDD, conversation driven development, and then an increasing amount of automation of that process. And we really, you know, imagine the, the developer experience evolving in quite significant ways and changing in quite significant ways um, as we reach these higher levels of sophistication. So firstly, just a very quick introduction to uh, the five levels from the perspective of an end user, the person who's using the assistant, right? And so a level one assistant puts all the work on the end user to describe very precisely what they want, right? And so the example I've got here is of a command line app, um, but actually whether you're filling out a form on a website or running a command line app, they're kind of the same experience, right? It's provide me these fields that I need. Um, and so in this case, you know, I've mocked up uh, a program for getting a mortgage quote where the user has to provide uh, the amount they want to borrow, the duration and the rate type. And I mean, this is, of course, you know, something that would typically be used by an expert, right? These days, very few people um, who aren't developers use command line apps. Um, but it's still much more simple, of course, than calculating a mortgage uh, by yourself. And so there's quite a bit of utility there, but we're really expecting you to know, to provide valid input to this program, right? You have to translate everything you want into this language. Um, and so the theme of going through the five levels is that we keep lowering that burden on the end user to translate the things that they want in their reality, in their life. Uh, into something that, you know, we as developers can understand or our organization can understand or in this particular example of uh, a mortgage quote into the bank's language, right? And so chatbots or what we call chatbots are really level two assistants. So it's a level up, right? Um, and so the way this typically works is that a user can express what they want to achieve um, in, in, you know, natural language, they can say, I'm interested in mortgage rates, right? Uh, and then they're guided through uh, a few steps and prompting them for the information that they need, right? 
uh, so in this case, we're asking them for how much how much they want to borrow, how long for, um, and so that's obviously much easier than than having to remember that command in the previous slide. Um, but the sort of the typical thing with a with a level two assistant or a chatbot is that as soon as you deviate from the happy path, the things go very badly wrong, right? And so the way we describe the happy path is if you prompt the user for some information, like you know how much they want to loan, um, the happy path is is when the user provides that information, and the unhappy path is anything else, right? So if the user asks a question, or they change their mind about what they want to do, or uh, they have a follow-on question, uh, they change their mind about what they said earlier, that kind of thing. Those are all the the unhappy paths. Um, and level two assistants, you know, very very quickly break when you deviate from the expected. A set of interactions. And so you're still expecting the user ultimately to um, follow along, to kind of massage their behavior. They still kind of have to know uh, how to play nice with the bot in order not to break it. And then in level three, we take it up a notch by saying, look, the user can say what they want and they can then have a relatively fluid conversation uh, within this narrow domain, right? So you're still just there trying to achieve a particular goal, right? Um, but we can have, you know, following questions, contextual questions, uh, co-reference, those kinds of things. So we can have a relatively fluid conversation within this fixed domain, right? And so we don't expect the user to comply or just play nice or just follow the happy path, right? They can ask the questions that they have and they can change their mind about things. They can provide information in any order, uh, correct themselves, etc. Um, without the assistant sort of breaking, they can still help their user. And then when we take it up to level four, we stop asking the user to exactly express what they want as a goal that we know the assistant can help them with, right? So in level three, the user still came in and, and asked about a mortgage quote and then had some flexibility in how to get that, right? But of course, um, if you really want to help a user, you have to speak their language. And so something that a, a person might perfectly well say is not that they need a mortgage quote, but you know, they describe the situation they're in, right? They're looking for a smaller house in this case. And the mortgage quote might be the, the end result, right? But the user doesn't have to know that, right? They can, you can help them figure out. So rather than the user coming to the assistant, knowing exactly what they are expecting it to do for them, uh, the assistant can help them figure that out. Right, so they can help them figure out how how the bank in this case can help. And then level five recognizes not just you know what the, how they can help the user, um, but the, the the type of help that the user wants and the level of sophistication that the user is looking for. Right. So if a user comes in with a message like this one, where they've clearly done a lot of research, it's clearly not their first conversation on the topic. Um, they're I've, looking for I've very just, precise information. You know, what do you have to help? And, um, and we can adapt to that and give them that kind of level of detail, right? Whereas if someone's maybe just coming and looking for like a ballpark figure, you know, how much do I think I could borrow? Um, or they're just beginning to learn about mortgages, we can give them the appropriate amount of information and we can detect all of that just from the way that the user is speaking to the assistant, right? And so, I hope it's clear that the, the arc of these five levels is speaking the, the, the person's language rather than the person translating into the bank's view of the world. Um, and so the philosophy that we sort of encourage people to adopt uh, in making that happen and making progress towards level five conversational AI is called conversation-driven development, right? And it's really simple. It's just about listening to users. And so, you know, quick bit of motivation, uh, why we need something like CDD, why do we need this philosophy? Why do we need this particular approach? So probably many people uh, listening to this have built conversational AI before, right? Uh, and if, you do, if you've done that, one, you know that it's very hard, right? It's really not an easy or solved problem. Um, and you also know that building a prototype is not the hard part, right? Actually getting a prototype up and running is, is fairly straightforward. Um, and the fiendishly difficult thing about this is that none of the hard problems show up in the prototype, right? So all these difficult problems only show up when you start to 
work out the edge cases and try and get ready for production. And so the kind of two goals we have for CDD are one, to give us all a sort of roadmap and a methodology for building better conversational AI. Um, but maybe even more importantly is to save newcomers from learning this the hard way, right? That not everybody has to slip on the same banana peels. And if we want to make, you know, progress uh, towards better conversational AI, everyone has to be able to go further than the people who came before them. So visually, uh, I like this uh, way of picturing what CDD helps you do. Um, so every prototype, every conversational AI project starts with a really tiny amount of overlap between the things that you've built that you expect your users to do and the things that your end users actually do, right? So the conversations that really happen, um, they're much richer and more diverse and more complicated and probably not what you were expecting at all, right? And so CDD is just about bringing these circles together, right? How can you um, make expectations match reality? How can you as quickly as possible adapt your assistant to actually meeting users where they are um, and you know, supporting the conversations that they want to have with you rather than the things that you dream up uh, in your lab? And so the methodology com uh, comprises six actions, right? Uh, call them steps here. Um, and they're called share, review, annotate, test, track, and fix. Um, and we start with share, uh, which is a really crucial piece, which is, you know, sharing your assistant as soon as you have the most, most minimal prototype running, right? The most basic happy path is implemented, go and give it to some test users, right? Because they will always surprise you. And there's no getting around it. There's no way you can go off into the mountains for three months uh, polish something and then give it to users and expect it to work. It doesn't ever work. It's never worked, right? Um, the only way to build good conversational AI is to build bad conversational AI and give it to people and let them break it and find out what they were expecting of it. Um, and then the subsequent steps are how do you actually take uh, take that feedback and use it to improve and and you know approach the way your users think about your uh, domain. Um, so the second step is to review. Uh, which means really go and look at conversations, right? Um, analytics are cool, but don't forget to actually look at conversations, right? And, and empathize with the user, understand the experience that they had. Um, annotate, right? Make sure that the messages that are coming in, right? Annotate those, use those as the source of your training data. Don't rely on synthetic data to train your NLU model, right? Go and annotate real user messages. Uh, if you're going into production, at least 90% of your training data should be, you know, real messages that users sent that you've annotated and added to your training set. Um, test, right? Uh, make sure you have tests running. Uh, make sure you have end-to-end -end conversations that, you know, you check on your CI server every time you make a change and they haven't broken anything or introduced a regression. Um, you know, just because we're building something which has a machine learning component doesn't mean that we should throw away all our good software development habits, right? Uh, we should still have end-to-end -end tests, regression testing, CI, CD, um, all these kinds of things. Tracking, um, it's important to set up some kind of automated way to track uh, whether your conversations are being successful or not. And often, you know, a proxy metric um, is the best way to go. So users taking an action, you know, they, they convert, they sign up for something uh, or not taking an action, like not getting back in touch uh, with support in a fixed time frame, that kind of thing. Those are all signals which aren't necessarily inside the conversation, right? But they are part of the user experience and they're informing you a lot about whether that conversation was successful or not. So bring in that outside context uh, to track which conversations are helping users and which aren't. Um, and then finally fix, uh, which is, of course, once you've identified all the ways that your assistant breaks, um, you know, just working through a, an issue tracker and making sure that you um, address all of those. Um, and I'll, I'll add that it's definitely not a linear process, even though I called them steps, uh, you definitely jump around between all of these. Right? 
Um, and here we've got it again um, with all the steps and what they are. And so I like to draw this analogy of adopting CDD as being similar to moving from waterfall development to agile development, right? Um, agile is all about leaning into the uncertainty that you have, right? You no longer pretend that you can plan out your feature roadmap for the next six months and then execute against that, right? That's not how software development works. It's not how product development works. Um, if you want to build the right product and you want to ship at a high velocity, um, you, you've got to practice agile development. And similarly, CDD is the opposite of going and dreaming up a bunch of conversations that users might have and building those into your chatbot and rather embracing the uncertainty that you have at the start, getting real users involved um, as early as possible uh, and making sure that you actually build the assistant that helps them and supports the goals that they care about and the things that they want to achieve. Uh, and it has you know, obvious benefits. I mean, the first one, of course, is you're helping more users. <laughs> so you're getting more return on investment uh, of all the work that you're putting in, um, especially if you're tracking um, you know, how, how many users you're helping in some automated way. Um, then you know, you're obviously going to make your users happier <laughs> because you're, uh, uh, you know, you're helping more of them um, and you're learning to speak their language right? rather than uh, putting the burden on them to translate what they want. Um, and then thirdly, you know, again, just embracing software development best practices, embracing that you want end-to-end -end tests, that you want code reviews, that you want you know, version control, uh, that you want CI, CD, all these things. Um, those are all the things that make you move fast, right? Um, the, the trick to shipping software with high velocity is to spend lots of time in code review and write lots of tests, right? Because that means when you build something new, you can focus on building the new thing and not fixing the bug that you introduced last week. Um, so a few comments about how we, seeing this, how we see this play out in conversational teams, right? Especially in enterprises. Um, and I mean, the first thing to say is, of course, these actions uh, require a mix of skills, right? And so uh, you hopefully have a data scientist and a, an engineer working on your project, but of course you also need that deep understanding of the user, um, the domain expertise, what they want, um, the sort of empathy for, for what they're experiencing. And so it's always a team effort. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, these are just some of the roles that you need. And it doesn't mean that each one of those has to be played by an individual separate person, right? Quite often, like the product manager and the UX designer can be the same. The developer and the data scientist might be the same person. So of course it depends on uh, the size of your team and the size of your investment. Um, but these are all roles that, that have to be played and covered by somebody. Right? Um, and so, you know, across different types of companies and different levels of maturity of, um, of a particular assistant and how mission critical it is, uh, these are some of the kind of typical, you know, t-shirt size teams uh, that we, we see, especially like early projects, you know, it might really just be three people um, working together on it. Uh, all the way to like large teams with you know uh, ten or more uh, uh, people working on an assistant and, and building it and practicing CDD together. So that's all I had to say about conversation driven development and uh, the five levels of conversational AI. Uh, of course, there is much more <laughs> uh, out there on the web and much more to learn and people to chat to. Um, so if you Google CDD playbook. Um, we have a whole bunch of resources on our website, uh, absolutely free. You don't even have to give us your email to download it. Um, lots of really detailed information on how you can implement CDD in your uh, organization. Uh, there's a LinkedIn group on conversation driven development. If you want to join it, lots of people sharing uh, tips and tricks. Um, we have a project management template uh, for conversational teams, how to plan out uh, all the steps to rolling an assistant out in production, um, and a few other links on uh, the sort of future of CDD and, and how it works in enterprises. And if you want to get really into depth on any of these topics, uh, next week we've got the Rouse of Summits. Um, tickets uh, are on sale until I think midnight on Monday. Um, so you still got a bit of time to get your tickets. 
Uh, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers, um, you know, from different industries, from different, um, you know, people building conversation like I, uh, as well as some research topics, really cutting edge stuff. And um, so would encourage all of you to sign up and join. Um, it's going to be really good. And, you know, you get lots of um, really deep expertise uh, on conversation driven development and conversation AI in general. And that's it. So thanks very much for listening. Um, feel free to shoot me an email if you've got any questions or if you disagree with any of this, um, don't mind at all. Uh, please reach out. And uh, yeah, thanks again for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.